Celeb Savant is a career retrospective type interview focusing on singers, actors and industry experts. Join Barrett Edelstein now as he dives into the entertainment world. Gabrielle Pike is a renowned British entertainment journalist. In the 1970s, she worked at the Thames Television Studio. She then left to join the music business and started working for the iconic weekly German youth culture bible, Bravo magazine. The aim was to deliver exclusive interviews, productions and photos of popular artists to the ever-growing fan base of teenagers across Europe. Here she met famous photographers like Terry O'Neill, Brian Aris, Mick Rock, organized studio shoots with well-known artists and was introduced to live music in iconic venues. She had the opportunity to see many iconic artists live, including Queen, David Bowie and Live Aid. She has repeatedly interviewed many of the 80s chart-topping UK artists. During the 80s and early 90s, she worked for a number of German youth culture magazines before returning to Bravo to take the lead in helping to launch Take That's Career in Europe in the 90s. The 90s also produced a host of American acts, and after helping to launch them in Europe, she travelled all over the world with the likes of Backstreet Boys, NSYNC and Britney Spears. In the early noughties, she switched from music to fashion and spent the next 14 years attending London Fashion Week twice a year, as well as interviewing film stars at press junkets in London. Up next on Slab's Fight, we've got Gabrielle Pike. Where in the world are you and how are you doing? I'm uh, outside of London in a place called Farnham, and I'm doing well. Yeah, I'm doing fine. So now let's rewind. Uh, You've had a multi sort of decade career in different aspects of the entertainment world. So at what age did you think, cool, whether as a child or teenager, that you want to be part of this industry and how did that journey progress? I never, ever thought I would be part of that industry. <laughs> I was a fan. I loved music. And, yes. of course, you know, my my sort of uh, uh, love for music um, was a sideshow. But I never thought I'd actually end up working in it. So when I started working for television, I really wanted to carry on with that. I wanted to become a, a, a you know, a, an assistant to a producer or director. Um, that didn't work out. And then um, I spotted this ad in one of the English papers, which always had job ads in it. And uh, it basically said um, that they need, somebody needed a, a German-speaking a uh, fluent um, English German speaking uh, assistant, and I applied. It was round about the time of Wimbledon in England, you know, July, beautiful time. Um, I went for the interview at this um, woman's house. Um, we had champagne, strawberries, and cream. There was a pop star sitting on the sofa, and she said, When can you start? Oh, wow. That's how I came into <laughs> Okay, so, uh, and, and what was that? position for which was that for bravo yeah it was uh i i was the assistant to the chief reporter uh or the correspondent actually as we called it then and uh basically it meant i had to literally was thrown in at the deep end had to get everything organized everything sorted out for photo shoots and bookings and um deal with photographers who came in to the office showed us their pictures and made selections sent things off you know it was literally a non-stop it was all literally all or nothing am i correct my understanding it was a magazine yeah bravo at that time was just a magazine it okay. later on when i went back uh, the second night time, it developed into something much, much bigger. We had a Bravo Super Show where we invited um, uh, bands that were popular to uh, play two or three numbers. We had um, a Bravo TV. We had uh, uh, Bravo Girl, Bravo Sport, Bravo LPs, but anything that you could possibly think of. It just literally expanded. But at the time when I joined, it was just the magazine, magazine. but it was huge. And is it still running uh, today? Well, um, I think it's probably still online. But oh, no. um, the, the those times w- that we had, yeah. where we had literally, you know, access to everything, the golden years, um, they are no longer. And so Bravo has is no longer a leading uh, music magazine. Okay, so when you arrived as the assistant and thrown in the deep end. Did you know what you would be what you would be doing or you were just like okay yeah and then you had to sort of figure it out for yourself 
yeah, the second. <laughs> I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing. And I actually arrived at the office. I was on my own for the whole day because my my boss was out uh, on a photo shoot. So I just, just answered the phone and did what I thought was best. So you obviously use organized photo shoots and all the sort of behind the scenes. What were the next steps that then became you starting doing interviews for the magazine? Right. Well, that happened probably about uh, a couple of years later because um, I was actually doing more and more coverage of concerts. So I went off and because, um, you know, the lady who was my boss at the time lived outside of London, beautiful area, but she really didn't want to hang around in London. I moved into London, moved into Notting Hill. And uh, so I was there and I could actually go to all the gigs. I could, you know, do the parties and so on and so forth. So it was a natural transition. And then when I left, um, strangely enough, one of my colleagues who had come over to England a lot to do interviews um, also left uh, the magazine. And he then got in touch with me and he's, he was um, writing for, he was the editor, became the editor for a new German magazine in, in the music business. And he asked me if I wanted to be his London correspondent. And I said, yes. So that's when I started doing interviews. And that was probably about the beginning the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. So just as things were kicking off with and, all the, um, you know, the Brit, Brit, British music scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, so, were, so it wasn't at Bravo. So you started doing it, the interviews for this next part of your career with the German uh, publication, correct? Yeah. When you started doing interviews, how did you approach it? Was it just a natural thing because you'd been in the industry interacting with these people for so long? And you just felt comfortable diving in, or were there a little, a little bit of trepidation? No, there was no trepidation because I'd obviously been, you know, busy um, dealing with lots of different things for the last two years, and also I'd met a lot of the artists yeah. already because you know we were doing photo shoots. Um, we did, um, you know, uh, masses of, of uh, interviews and so on, uh, and I put things together. I, you know, got props organized and so on. So that wasn't actually I wasn't scared. Um, but the first artists that I did individual interviews with was Status Quo, and they were really funny, and they were they have such a wicked sense of humour. So it was this typical, you know, sort of uh, they always took the Mickey out of me. And uh, <laughs> but we had we did some great interviews, some great photo shoots. So there you go, the boys were great. <laughs> it's interesting for me. I'm quite naive and gullible, so when someone takes the Mickey out of me. I don't. I take them seriously, and I don't realize it's a joke until they start laughing. So <laughs> that's me. What happens with me? <laughs> well, when you when you live in London or when you live in England, and I'm from Germany originally, yes. so they always, you know, the, it takes a while to actually understand the English sense of humor, and you have to go with it. And they always take the Mickey out of you, <laughs> and they do it to themselves as well. So yes. and you have to get used to it. Yeah. So how long would you then now? sort of a reporter or interviewer for this German publication? Well, I just carried on. I never stopped. Okay. So the whole of the 80s and the whole of the 90s, those were my music business uh, days. And uh, obviously, you know, there were lots of exciting bands and uh, and I actually uh, managed to promote some of them and make them uh, popular in the German um, or European scene, really, because the magazine uh, that I I went to was actually more German based. But then when I went back to Bravo in the 90s, that was um, right across Europe, all the European countries. And um, and I still hear now, I mean, this Romanian girl said to me the other day, oh, she said, you wrote, you wrote Bravo. Oh, my God, I still have all the copies in my garage at home. And she was from <laughs> Romania. And I went, great. So, you know, it was a, such a huge magazine and it, the influence was enormous. I mean, we had two million sales per week. Wow. So if you put somebody on the cover and you did a, you know, in, did a, a cover story with it, they would become very well known and very well liked. And of course, I did that with quite a few of the bands that I work with. You reference sort of promoting the bands. Was it through the magazine, as you mentioned on the cover, and through the interviews and articles, or were there other things outside of that that you also did with them and for them? Well, I mean, I created um, stories okay. um, sometimes with the with the um, help of the management, sometimes with the help of the record company, and sometimes just 
basically on my own. And those stories became synonymous with, you know, the, the art. I mean, let's face it, you know, a, a German magazine that has two, two million readers a week can actually have quite a lot of power. Yeah. And we did. And uh, it was a youth culture magazine. It appealed to young people. It was all there for the youth. And all they want is they want to hear more and more and more and see more and more and more yeah. of their artists, of their of their idols. Yeah. And I made sure that they did. So I recognize what you're saying. I don't think we got Bravo in South Africa. But we definitely used to get smash hits in number one. And I used to love rushing to the shop, tearing open the magazine, reading it from cover to cover. That whole journey, that whole experience and that whole joy was filled through my body. Obviously, the internet wasn't around then. So we only sort of had the, that as an access point of the characters and the artists and the performers. But now with the advent of digital and it's totally accessible, what are your thoughts of the transition of having seen have been the only access point for people to receive information and now it's just everywhere well it's a shame in a way because you know uh, what we did and by the way smash hits was based on bravo the guy okay. who created smash hits actually said to me he said you know i want to do something like bravo in england but he only ever managed to do it fortnightly and their sales were way below uh, okay. our sales this is just a, as a sideline. Yes. But it is actually quite a shame because at the time, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have mobile yeah. phones. We didn't really have any. And so the fans got all the information through uh, the magazines like you know, Bravo and then Smash It and, and so on and so forth because we provided the exclusives for them. And that was amazing. And so we could, could in a way, we could control it. You know, the German magazines or rather all the music magazines, youth culture magazines were not critical we actually only gave them the good stuff yes. so basically what they got was lots and lots of information lots of details lots of pictures but they didn't get you know we weren't scandal mongering not like um you know the lovely uh, british tabloid press yes they turn everything into a scandal so that was not that's not what uh, the idea was because it was for the fans it was a fan magazine literally yes. and that's what it, it remained throughout its entire existence Hey, this is another interesting point that you referenced the scandal and the gossip and what's now called clickbait, but it wasn't around then because it was a magazine. And I, you know, I relate to what you're saying because I'm more for the positive story, the upliftment, the information about the artists. What was the decision in your guys' mind to think, okay, we're only going to focus on that, which I feel is a more <laughs> better path, but n no judgment. It's just different. But what was the initiation or the the thing that drove you guys to think, okay, we want to do the positives and ignore the gossip? Well, it was a sort of joint editorial decision, really. You know, I mean, every now and again, obviously, you had the gossip that had to go in, you know, obviously. Yeah. And I did my, my share of it. But uh, generally, you know, just to tear an artist down, to build an artist up and then tear tear the artist down just for the fun of it. That was just simply not, uh, uh, you know, part of it. It wasn't the the the, the motto, you know. Um, Bravo magazine always um, prided itself in delivering fantastic uh, articles and lots and lots of detail and information. And this is why, in a way, it worked really positively for, for me because the artist trusted you. You know, there wasn't this yes. distrust. They actually were happy to do more and more and more stories. Yeah. They were quite happy for you to to cover them. They were quite happy for you to be around them because they knew you wouldn't necessarily, you know, dish the mm. dirt or yeah, whatever. Yes. So it, yeah, it really was. It was a very productive, uh, cooperative, um, working relationship, and it really made a huge difference because they got the most fantastic publicity. This is what we were doing. We were giving them free publicity because mm. at the time there was no internet. You know, they had their their um, uh, record companies who were doing their best, but generally getting right to the fans were um, all of us who were writing those magazines. You know, that was the direct contact. So they had free publicity from from all sides. That person who was working at the television station before who wanted to get into music, that person who now became all of this and did all these things, did she actually think, yes, she wants to get into music, but realize the impact and the steps and the journey that she would create? 
or was it a surprise? Well, it was a surprise because I had no idea what was going to happen. It was more or less, you know, you just uh, from day to day, you just literally went through. I mean, when I started working with, um, you know, certain bands who I did lots and lots of uh, uh, features with, um, it, it just sort of developed um, as we went along, you know, things that they did, things that I wanted to do, you know, and uh, it actually worked out really, really well from that point of view. For instance, I mean, what, what I did, I said, because I also became an agent for photographers for a little while. I had some really good photographers on my on my uh, books, if you like. And so I, I placed these photographers into uh, the situations where I was covering something for the magazines and they were. The, the, they were actually doing the photos the, uh, for it. And um, so I sort of created new ways of doing photography because most of the bands of the 80s had to literally go from place to place and do photo shoot after photo shoot after photo shoot. They went to Italy, they went to, you know, um, yeah. uh, Holland and whatever, and everybody wanted photo shoots of them. So I actually suggested to their management why don't we just do one big photo shoot one day in a massive studio with different uh, setups, different clothes. So, and then you literally, we have the, uh, your band for the day and then we can actually give it in exclusive uh, pictures to whoever, you know, we can discuss it with you, who you want the exclusive pictures for. So we did that and that was actually a really huge success. And then, you know, it kind of developed into favoritism, you know, bands like certain photographers, you know, they say, oh, can, oh, yes. can we, with so and so, you know, so it's, um, yeah, it was a really good time because all of this was new. Don't forget, there was no music business. We created yes. the music business. We created youth culture. It all started at that time, which was amazing. So when you were doing these photo shoots with the band, the management and the photographer and yourself, what, how much input did the band management have? Or was it completely directed by the photographer or was it with equally contribution communication wise from everyone? It depends on the band. I mean, okay. some of them had, um, you know, their own ideas, which is fine, you know, so you work with them. Um, and the photographer is usually the one who actually has the, uh, you know, sort of controls it and directs it. Um, and others were just happy to basically follow what, what, uh, what was put in front of them. So the photographers I had were pretty good. You know, they were actually, um, you know, they were quite innovative. And uh, uh, one German photographer who is actually still around, all he'd ever did was fill a room with props. That was his idea of a good photo. <laughs> <laughs> But we then stopped all of that, you know, because what you really need is just a backdrop and then you have to create the, the image. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it was a mix, you know, not every not every artist or not every band has somebody who has that creative side. They mm. create music. They, they're creative on, in other ways, yes. but not necessarily on photo shoots. Let's say top five artists that you did not have the opportunity to interview that you would have loved to do so. Oh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe just top of mind, just top, maybe just three top of mind things. Oh, I didn't interview them, them or them, and I would have loved to have done so. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, sort of after the 90s, I guess, you know, this sort of, I have to say that I actually met Beyonce, believe it or not. She, oh, this is so bizarre. Um, I was doing an, an interview and photo shoot with Christina Aguilera. She was on tour and we went to Detroit. And this is my American photographer. We went to Detroit mm -hmm. um, and we did, you know, the photo shoot with uh, Christina. And uh, it was literally um, the most amazing coincidence that Destiny's Child was supporting Christina Aguilera on okay. the tour. Yeah. So we met Destiny's Child, you know, and of course Beyonce was there. Yeah. So that was incredible. Um, and at that stage, she was literally, they were just a support band and yeah. they did an amazing set and about three costume changes within that set. Oh, wow. And it was just, oh, it was just incredible. I mean, this was just, you know, as a starter and opening. Yeah. Uh, and um, you could tell immediately that this, these women and especially Beyonce had, uh, more than just a passing talent. Yes. They were 
be big. So I didn't actually get around to interviewing her because we ran out of time and they ran out of time, which was such a shame. Yes. But we did have pictures and so on. So that's one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think that's definitely one. Now, if I was around these days, I would love to interview Taylor Swift, obviously. Yeah. Because, yeah. Um, she is just phenomenal. And I did interview Kylie, but not very long. Um, so that I'd love to do another proper interview with you, her. Yeah. Um, yeah. So she's my height. So we're both tiny. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just yeah. saying it. There's all my friends. I love all music and all artists, but I've got a special thing for Kylie. She, uh, since I was like a teenager. So when you mentioned her, I was like, ah, oh, okay. <laughs> she's, she's sweet. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard she's very lovely. What are you doing now? Are you retired now or are you doing anything at the moment? I'm doing a podcast with you. <laughs> no, yeah, beyond that. <laughs> oh, beyond Work-wise, that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. What I am doing actually is, uh, is I, I do want to uh, put what I haven't said at this stage, and I I'm, I'm better mention that, all my interviews that I ever did on cassette, I still have them. So I have oh. this massive archive. I've never taped over any of them, which is what used to be the case, because a lot of the reporters always just used a couple of tapes and then just taped over them. I've kept all of mine. So I have a fantastic archive of something like 300, 400 tapes wow. um, of all the interviews I've done. And, um, and I want to... Um, try and do something with that. There are some plans um, in the pipeline, which is hopefully going to come out soon. I'm about to write a book because everybody keeps telling me, you've got to write a book, you've got to write a book. <laughs> yes. so I think I'm just going to have to, I'm going to have to sit down and write it because there's so many anecdotes, so many fantastic stories that go with it. This is the other thing. You see, I have all these anecdotes to go with the, yes. with the interview. Because it was, you know, the build up and what happened and how it came together and, you know, all that kind of stuff. As a fan, if you're a fan, that's what you love. Exactly. I know. They always ask me when I see any of them, they say, what's so and so like and what happened and what did you do and how, you know, it is literally, it's, it's a thing about, um, you know, everybody wants to know everything about their favorite artist. A story that you have about an interview that was not supposed to happen or was a little bit challenging that eventually did happen and had a good story behind it? Well, it was really the David Bowie thing, okay. you know, I mean, that, it, it's a, because what happened, EMI Records actually, uh, you know, released the album. He, he signed up with EMI. They basically relaunched his career in a commercial way, which probably was a really good thing for him because, um, David Bowie, although he was brilliant, he didn't have a huge younger fan base. Well, of course, the album Let's Dance and the series Moonlight 2 changed all of that. So he literally became a, a sort of household name, if you like, and created new art, new fans, a new, um, a, a new, completely new audience for himself. Um, and of course, lots and lots of things came out of that. So when that was launched, I was, I was doing a lot with EMI because a lot of the bands that I was working with were on EMI at the time. And they said to me, look, just, you know, we, we're doing this launch at uh, Claridge's, just go along like, you know, a lot of the uh, uh, international press and national press were all there. And uh, unbeknown to me, completely unbeknown to me, um, this uh, photographer, no, it wasn't a photographer, it was a cameraman, actually zoomed in on me. So halfway through the um, press conference, and I have the footage as well, um, all of a sudden he zooms in on my face and lingers on my face for quite a long time. And I had no idea about this until many years later. So, but what did happen, I actually, um, uh, at the time, wanted to do an interview with David Bowie. Well, it wasn't possible uh, throughout the whole of the UK tour, nothing was possible. So then when he went over to the States, uh, the photographer that uh, was on tour with him was actually one of the photographers I'd represented as an as an agent. And also I gave him lots and lots of uh, uh you know, work in the past, mm. and he was on tour. So um, I said to him, "Look, I mean, try and get me an interview because I really, really want to do this um, interview with David Bowie." And then, in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning in August, just before my birthday in, <laughs> in 1983, uh, I never forget. He called up and he said, "Get yourself over to Chicago. He's, he wants to do an interview with you." Oh so wow! 
I dropped everything. I literally just booked my flight, went over to Chicago, and um, and then actually got escorted uh, backstage. Did the interview. David was charming, but uh, Coco Schwab came in, his assistant. She said, "Right, that's it." She said, "You're finished now." And she said, "You know," and he said, "No, no, I'm enjoying myself. I'm, you know, I, I really carry on." So we carried on, and you know, talked about all sorts of things. And I said to him, "So why aren't you doing interviews in the U.S.?" Because he turned down everything in the states, uh, including time and you know, uh, mm. really sort of big names. He said, well, while I'm here, my profile is so high that if I do interviews, if I do any press at all, I won't be able to move. I will literally be stuck in my hotel room. I won't be able to move. I literally am going to be a prisoner um, in my world, in my own world. So he said, that's why I'm not doing anything with any uh, American press at the moment. So um, so we carried on talking. He said, right. He said, have you seen the show? I said, yeah, I have seen it a couple of times. And he said... Do you want to watch it from backstage? And I said, I'd love to. He said, well, <laughs> we're just about to have dinner, me and the band. He said, do you, do you want to join us? So I sort of ended up in this amazing situation where I was, after the interview, where I was having dinner with mm. David and the band. And then I watched the whole show from backstage. It was fantastic. It was probably the biggest surprise ever. Hey, you know what I think? And I've had not as massive, but I've sort of had similar situations. And I feel that because and focusing on you, that because you're not there to get the gossip, you just want to speak to the person behind the stage persona, so to speak, and you connect with them on that unconscious, subconscious level, it becomes a situation of like, ah, this is like just a person I'm chatting with. They're not getting here yeah, to get the gossip or to trip trip me up to get the you know, that kind of stuff. And I think they appreciate that and they like it. And then they think, ah, I like this person. <laughs> well, it it worked. I mean, I just, all, all I ever did was have a, a chat with yes. all the artists. I didn't have a clipboard. Yes. I didn't have prefabricated questions. Yes. I just went along with what they said. You know, I obviously did my, you know, sort of homework and yeah. knew what, what it was all about. But I never actually um, made them feel uncomfortable. And they just relax. Yes. And then once you start chatting, you know, all sorts of things happen. You go with the flow. So you actually, when they give you an answer, you think, oh, right. So that leads to another question. Yes. That leads to another answer. So that's how all my interviews worked. And, and they all loved it. I mean, I never had a problem with any of the artists that I interviewed. Um, it worked. It's interesting because when I first started doing interviews, I used to have my little board of my paper of questions and I used to hold on to that. And then I noticed they would deviate off of that sort of thing. And then I was missing sort of golden nuggets. And then when I threw away the paper, it just freed me so much to know, okay, wow, this is, it's just a chat. It's not like. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, this happened, uh, we, I did an interview with Kate Moss, but it was in a group. So there were four of us or five of us, can't remember. And we were all allowed to ask her a couple of questions. This yep. was for uh, for the perfume that she was um, putting out through one of the cosmetic companies. And they said, you know, no more, very strict, you know, just the two questions. The first thing I did, she came into the room and she had the most gorgeous top on it was a blouse and I said to her oh my god I love you I love your blouse I said well where's it from and she went oh she's an Aussie clock and I got it in the second hand shop in Notting Hill <laughs> so that's how it started <laughs> and the guy from the from the uh, you know um, cosmetic company was <laughs> looked, shooting me daggers and then later on we actually I don't know how we got onto this but you know we sort of said you know how how to sort of make yourself look fresh uh, even if you've had a bit of a, you know, sort of a, a late night or something. Yeah. She, she always drinks a glass of champagne. So I brought my glass of champagne up from down below. So we're both sipping on champagne. <laughs> so she, I said, well, what I do, I said, I always put two spoons in the deep freeze and then put them on my eyes. And then that actually clears the eyes. And she said, ah, I can go one better. So this is Kate Moss's tip on how to look bright and fresh. Yes. You put your whole face in a bowl of ice cubes. Oh, wow. Okay. That's interesting. You can try that. <laughs> yes, it will, definitely. After a heavy night. 
No, I mean, it is literally, it's what you, you, what you get. And I wouldn't have got that if I just sat there and stiffly just sort of waited exactly. for my turn to ask a question. Yeah. It just evolved from the conversation, which yeah. is exactly how interviews should be done. Uh, I totally agree. Absolutely. Gabrielle, you've been on the periphery of the industry for a number of years. So I would like your observations and thoughts on this discussion. So I love me a CD. I still budget for my CDs every month. For me, it's an energy exchange. And thank you to the artists for all the hard work they've done. Uh, I love the journey of the choice, the receiving, the unpacking, the listening from one song, one to whatever number. I'm not sure if you're aware that vinyls are on a massive comeback. 5.9 million sales in the UK last year, biggest since 1990. Cassettes even are in a comeback. And CDs, they're back in the, as I understand, the UK has a basket of products that they gauge tax on. And because of the upsurge of CDs, I read an article now, they're back in that basket. But we've also got these streaming platforms that people consume music on. What are your perceptions of their landscape at the moment? Well, I understand, obviously, that, you know, there's a new generation and they listen to music differently, very differently. But I think, you know, if you're actually a real music fan, there is nothing like a yeah. vinyl. Um, a cassette is OK, but they yeah. do get sort of muddled up sometimes, yes. you know. <laughs> But vinyl is definitely the answer because I do think that it, all the, you know, sort of great artists, all the, you know, that you have something tangible. You have something in your hand, something that you can put on a turntable, something that you can actually listen to. You can stop, you can repeat, whatever. I just think that is a much more interesting and, and probably more satisfying way of listening to mm. music. And I know a lot of young people. Um, have actually gone back to vinyl. They yes. love it. Absolutely love it. Uh, cassette, I'm not so sure about because, you know, as I said, they do get messy. Right. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you need a pen. That's yeah. the kind of. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I think, I mean, any, any kind of music, the way that people want to listen to it, I think is amazing because it's just so, important for us to have that um to have your favorite artists to have your favorite songs and all that kind of thing and what's also interesting you know you're talking about the comeback of all of this is that now i don't know about south africa but certainly in the uk you've got all of these classic radio stations which play music from the 80s and the 90s you know yeah. the, the sort of concentrate yes. on those periods or the yes. 60s or the 70s it is literally it's and it's the young people who listen to it. Yes. It's interesting enough. The it's 20 somethings. Yeah. In fact, um, sorry to interrupt. So there's a new, uh, new, I say new, it's about four or five years young, which I suppose is pretty new, radio station focused in Johannesburg that only plays 80s, 90s, and it's become the biggest radio station in the, in the city. <laughs> This is the same here. You know, the BBC always used to lead and literally, you know, um, uh, the figures were always uh, astronomical. But in the last year and a half, um, it's all changed. It's gone to Greatest Hits Radio. Greatest yes. Hits Radio is a fantastic DJ called Ken Bruce, who um, is a favourite. He was with the BBC. He did an amazing programme. All his followers went with with him to the new radio station. Yes. They have now, they're now the biggest radio station in the UK. I mean, what more can I say? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We had the best years, the it's, 80s and the 90s. Totally agree, totally agree. So, Gabrielle, the podcast is listened to throughout the world. As a final message, what would you like to say? I really am so lucky that I have managed to uh, be part of that journey um, in the sort of late 70s, 80s and 90s. I'm really lucky. I consider myself to be very lucky because those were um, innovative years, not just for music, but for the business around it, for everything that uh, now is part and parcel of the of the music business. And um, And I'm also really delighted that most of these artists are still around yes. and they're still touring. <laughs> Yes. which is incredible. Thank you for listening to this episode of Celeb Savant. Please follow Barrett on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook at Celeb Savant. That's C-E-L-E-B-S-A-V-A-N-T.